Lux presents Hollywood. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater. Starring Mark Stevens, Richard Widmark, and Lloyd Nolan in The Street With No Name. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. There's an invisible battle raging constantly throughout this land. Tonight's play is the story of one incident in this battle between a ruthless underworld and the relentless courage of the men of the FBI. The play is The Street With No Name, and while directing the picture for 20th Century Fox, I had the privilege of working closely with the director of the FBI, Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, and seeing firsthand the machine-like precision of the Bureau. Tonight, we have the same three stars who were in the picture, Mark Stevens, Richard Widmark, and Lloyd Nolan, three accomplished players who bring the ring of cold truth to this fight between the champions of the law and the forces of evil. Of course, the housewives in our audience are waging a daily battle of their own these days, and many of them have chosen Lux Flakes as an ally. Their fight is to make nice things stay new-looking longer, a perfect assignment for Lux Flakes. And our stars have their assignments, so the curtain rises on the street with no name. Starring Mark Stevens as Gene Cordell, Richard Widmark as Alex Stiles, and Lloyd Nolan as Inspector Briggs. Some months ago, late at night, a group of men entered the Meadowbrook Club, a typical roadhouse on the outskirts of Center City. They drew guns, and their leader... This is a stick-up! Hands on the table and don't move. Come on, come on, snap it up. All right, get up against the wall. Methodically, the men right, proceeded to line the guests moving. up against the wall. Come on, you two Unfortunately, a woman became hysterical. She screamed. <laughs> Victim, Helen Jennings, housewife. Survivors, husband and two children. The bullet that killed Mrs. Jennings was sent by the Center City Police to FBI headquarters in Washington, examined and carefully catalogued. Five days later, also in Center City, a guard was murdered while trying to prevent the holdup of a bank. Two murders within five days in the same city. This bank robbery, a violation of a federal statute, gave the FBI jurisdiction to come in actively on the case. It was assigned to Inspector George A. Briggs. Briggs went at once to Center City. He was met by Richard Atkins, special agent in charge of the FBI field office. Well, your hunch was right, Atkins. The bullet that killed the bank guard came from the same gun that killed the Jennings woman, a Luger automatic. Tell me, you're getting any help from the police? Full cooperation. Hommet sees the chief and Lieutenant Stoller of the homicide squad. Yes, you uh, you mentioned a man named Demery. Oh, yes, a member of the city council, a chairman of the police advisory board. There's an election coming up. Oh, funny how certain politicians discover there's a police department just before an election. <laughs> yes. If it's all right with you, Inspector, suppose we go straight to police headquarters. Uh, chief Hommet? Uh, Lieutenant Stoller and uh, Councilman Demery, uh, Inspector Briggs. Uh, how do you doing, gentlemen? As a councilman, I'm certainly glad to see you, Inspector. We can use a little help right now. I guess Atkins has told you where we stand. I told him he can expect full cooperation, Chief. Uh, of course, there's no point trying to kid you, Inspector. Things here are in a pretty bad way. Yes, crime has really moved into this town. Oh, now, don't misunderstand me, Chief. Nobody's blaming you. You need more help than we've given you. The mayor and the council recognize that. But neither recriminations nor promises will give us results. And that's what we've got to get. So I I don't mind saying I feel a lot better with Chief Briggs here. Well, as far as the police department's concerned, we're... Excuse me. Yes? Good. That's more like it. Bring him in. Well, maybe we've got our first break. 
And what does that mean? A couple of the boys just picked up a suspect. Looks good. They're bringing him in now. <laughs> The suspect looked very good. Robert Danker, age 24. Tough guy, police record. But Danker refused to confess. Now, you better stop this double talk, Danker, and start giving us some facts. What time did you leave the Meadowbrook the night of the holdup? I told you I was never in that clip joint. You're certain of that? Sure, I'm certain. Well, then what about this, this driver's license? State of California made out to Robert Danker. Is it yours? Yeah. Yeah, it's mine. This license was found on the floor of the Meadowbrook right after Helen Jennings was murdered. And you tell us you weren't there. Ask the guy who swiped it how it got there. It's a frame. Who's framing I'll you? take care of him myself. Look, if you're being framed, we want to help you. Use your head, Danky. Your best chance to clear yourself is to prove you were framed. I'll prove it my own way when I get out of here. That may not be so easy. Okay, I'll take my chances. You claim that you were in Chicago the night of the holdup. Yeah, I was. Well, have you got any proof of that? Who who saw you there? Look, it's a city. Nobody sees you in the city. Well, what about a room clerk? Landlady? I didn't have no room. Well, where'd you sleep that night? Under a new building going up near the freight yard. A danker. This jacket you're wearing, what's this spot, this red spot here near the shoulder? It's paint, red paint. It come off a girder in the cellar of the building where I hold up. All right, danker, take it off. It's paint, I tell you. What are you booking me on? For the time being, suspicion of robbery. Danker's jacket was sent immediately to the FBI laboratories for microscopic examination and chemical analysis. They teletyped their findings to our office in Center City. Lieutenant Staller was with the chief when I arrived at police headquarters. Well, what's the score, Inspector? Well, Staller, the red paint was paint. The red spot was paint. Danker is innocent. Innocent? That's right, Chief. That girder was painted at 5.30 on the afternoon of the murder was quick-drying paint, six to eight hours. Mm -hmm. The paint penetrated Danker's jacket just enough to show that it was almost dry at the time that Danker rubbed against it. Well, and the kid was framed, huh, with that driver's license. Now, if we can get him to open up about that license, when he lost it or if he lent it to somebody. Well, let's go talk to him now. I, uh, I've got to run along. Uh, let me know how you make out, Stoller. So we went to the jail, Lieutenant Stoller and I. Only Danker wasn't there. Early that morning, he'd been released on bail. Bail furnished by the personal bonding company. Their office was right across the street. That's right, gentlemen. $5,000 bail for one Robert Danker. You mind telling us who put up the money? Oh, no, not at all. It's right here on the card. John Smith. Ah. You know this Mr. Smith? Never met him before in all my life. Wouldn't know him if I saw him again. Any address? Yes, but I think you'll find it just as phony as the name. They all do it. Here, Hotel Conlon. All right, let's go, Stella. Glad to help you boys any time at all. That night, at 20 minutes past 11, a body with numerous knife wounds was found on the main highway leading from Center City. It was identified as... Robert Danker. I spent the next day with Atkins, our field agent, getting together certain essential information about Center City. I then returned to Washington. This case wasn't for me, and it wasn't for Atkins. It would have to be handled by someone who had never been seen in Center City before by someone uniquely qualified for a very tough assignment. Ten days later, I had picked him out. His name, Gene Cordell. I was going over the case with Cordell when Cy Gordon came into my office. Hello, Inspector. You tell me you got a job for me. Yeah, pull up a chair, Cy. Oh, I, I don't suppose you know Gene Cordell? Doesn't know me. Huh. Who brought me into the Bureau? Kept me from being a wealthy lawyer. How are you, Cy? <laughs> Glad to see you again, G. Oh, I, uh... I was just telling Gene about this Center City affair. Now, it's pretty obvious that the same gang that pulled the bank robbery also pulled the Meadowbrook job and framed Robert Danker. Gene, take a look at these maps. Now, we know that Danker's hangout was right here in this section. 
Skid Row, huh? That's right, Skid Row. Here's Dark Street. Here's where Danker had a room. Royal Hotel. These are the various pool rooms and dives he was known to hang out in. And here's the Dock Street gym. Gym? That's right. It's up one floor from the street for prize fighters. It's a place to train a few sparring rings. It's also a hangout for hoodlums and gamblers. Since the war, at least half a dozen gangs have sprung up in this one area alone. And I'm convinced that one of them is responsible for the murders of the Jannings girl, the bank guard, and now Danker. Now, Gene, you're going to follow in Danker's footsteps. Drift into Center City sometime next week. Get a room at the Royal Hotel. And start trying to work yourself in. Cy here's going with you. I couldn't ask for anyone better. This is a one-man job, Gene. Cy will only be your contact. He'll get a room across the street from the Royal Hotel and put in a radio. And as soon as you learn anything, pass it on to him. Now, this Danker was a tough kid who knew his way around. You're to be his carbon copy. Now, I'll tell you exactly what I've got in mind. Well, that's how Gene Cordell went to Center City with Cy Gordon as his liaison. You're going to hear now what happened to him there. And I guess the best way to reconstruct it is to give you the facts just as they occurred. For two weeks, Gene Cordell, now using the name of George Manley, bummed around Skid Row, pool rooms, beer parlors, any place where he could be seen and accepted as a mug who knew his way around. Smart talking, tough. And then Gene started showing up in the Dock Street gym, watching the sparring match. And ring number two, uh, Baby McGee and now going in against Rudy Adano. Ring number one, Kid Javano, boxing press bay. Gene Cordell knew a little something about boxing himself. He started to needle one of the fighters. Hey, Javino, step in with that left jab. What's the matter with you? Keep it up high. Okay, now, shoot the right. Shoot it! Ah, oh, get some brains. You're telegraphing it. Hey, Snoke, dry up, will you? Counterpunch, kid, I told you, counterpunch! Keep your right up, Javino. Block when he hooks. Block! Now, luck, Buster. Take off. You his trainer? Yeah, I'm his trainer. What about it? What are you training for? A quick dive? Come on, keep your left up, sucker. He'll take your ears off. All right, wise guy. I'm trying to help you, boy. Could use a little sharpening up. Open your teeth once more and so help me out, will you? He bought a ticket to come in and watch, didn't he? Well, that don't I give me a lay off. Oh. Maybe you could show the kid a couple of things, huh? Could be. I'll give you five bucks if you can go one round. Make it ten. You got a deal. Hey, Matty, get the uh, champ some gear. He's going in there with the kid. Gene went three rounds. He took something of a shellacking, but I guess he figured it was worth it. A few minutes later in the dressing room... Not bad, not bad. Hey, you owe me 30 bucks. Here, yeah, take it, sucker. Okay, thanks. Hey, uh, you're Alex Stout, huh? Yeah, I'm Alex Stiles, huh? Some of the boys, they, uh, they point me out to you. You own this place, huh? Did you ever think of getting your teeth knocked in for more than just laughs? Mm, not anymore, I don't. Easier ways than that to, uh, pick up a quick buck. Yeah? For instance, maybe I'll let you know when I've, uh, run through your 30. Around the corner from the Dock Street gym, there's a penny arcade. Cordell and Gordon had picked it as one of their meeting places. Cordell was playing a pinball machine when Gordon wandered in and started playing the one next to him. I think I've got to leave. Go ahead. Dock Street gym. Somebody went through my wallet, lifted my social security card. Good, fine. Now, what you better do is it... Take it easy, cop. Just a minute, Duke. Oh, me? What's the matter? What's your name? What's it to you? Come on, let's have it. Manley. George Manley? Yeah. You're under arrest. Now, wait a minute. What for? Next time you break into a jewelry store, don't leave your social security card. Let's go, Manley. This is Gordon calling WFBI. Gordon calling WFBI. Come in, Gordon. Get this to Briggs, Washington. Cordell arrested early tonight. Suspicion of robbery. Tell Briggs 
Danker's shoes fit Cordell perfectly. That's all. Two days later, a routine request one of approximately 26,000 received daily by the FBI in Washington came into the identification division from the police department of Santa City. It asked for the complete file of a suspect under arrest for robbery. Name, George Manley. To prevent exposing George Manley's real identity, we sent a fake criminal record back to the Santa City police. And the following day, by teletype... Riggs from Atkins... Center City. George Manley released today on bail. Bail posted by John Smith. Bail posted by John Smith. Yes. What had happened to Robert Danker was happening to Agent Jean Cordell. Step by step. Cy Gordon was right. The shoes fit perfectly. Morning, Joe. Billy McCoy is now going with Bill Giordano. Hello, Georgie. Well, I haven't seen you around lately. How'd you know my name? Oh, I know lots of things, Georgie. Been away, huh? Yeah. Weekend in the country. Uh-huh. Courtesy of the city, huh? Yeah, something like that. Hey, wait a minute. What's your hurry, Georgie? What goes, style? Nothing. Nothing at all. I, uh, I was just thinking that, uh, maybe we ought to get to know each other better. You busy tonight? Not yet, I ain't. Then you're invited. Where? You'll find out later. Friend of mine will pick you up around 9 o'clock. The Royal, isn't it? Crummy joint. See you, George. Want a drink, honey? Put it down. How about giving you a little kiss? Do you mind? You're breathing down my neck. My affectionate husband. What am I supposed to do around here? You playing the piano and all your high-class friends playing poker. Sometimes... The door. Answer it. Well, what did you think I was going to do? Hi, Chevy. Come on in. Oh, a stranger. Hello, Georgie. Hi. Anything else, boss? No. Get yourself a hand in the poker game. Okay. Hey, uh, your friend there, uh, don't talk much, does he? Chevy? No. No, Georgie, none of my friends talk very much. Come on, I want to see you alone. You open? Sit down. What's your racket? What's yours? Sweet job you pulled in Pittsburgh. Smart. No conviction. Pittsburgh? I ain't never been in Pittsburgh. No? How about San Diego, April 47? Suspicion of armed robbery, no conviction. You got me crossed. How about Philly, last December? Grand larceny, no conviction. Miami, Richmond, Trenton, no conviction. Look, what are you selling? Here. Take a look at this report. A report direct from the FBI. Or, uh, should I say indirect. Through my pipeline here in Center City. In the police department, Georgie. I... I don't get it. What goes? I'm sorry about that weekend I gave you, but, uh, You see, I'm building an organization along scientific lines. I need men who know their way around, who can get by. That's why I screened you. Screened? Sure, just like in the Army. I spot a guy who looks good, so what do I do? I get him framed. The cops check his record through the FBI. The report comes through. I get the report. My own idea. Takes connections, but I've got them. Hey, uh, this, this report on me here. Ought to be back in the police files, huh, Georgie? It'll get back. Not bad. Coming in, Georgie? Well, if that's an offer, I'm sure grabbing it. It's an offer. Yeah, but wait a minute. What about my hearing? I'm supposed to show up in court Friday. That'll be fixed. Forget it. Oh, uh, there's just one little thing you'd better get straight, Georgie. I do the thinking. I give the orders. That's okay by me, boss. Huh. You know, I want to like you, Georgie. You catch on fast. Here, buy yourself a closet full of clothes. I like my boys to look sharp. Somebody 
WFBI calling Gordon. WFBI calling Gordon. Come in, WFBI. Inspector Briggs just arrived from Washington. Good. Put him on. Hello, Cy. Nothing new from Gene, huh? No, I'll check, Inspector. It's going to be a lot harder to contact from now on. He's with the Styles gang now most of the time. I want to see him as soon as possible. Have you any idea how? Well, today's Thursday. The usual meeting place for Thursdays is at night. A lunch wagon near the bay. Flat ferry leaves at 10.30. Suppose you're on that ferry, Inspector. I'll try to have him join you. Good. I'll be on the ferry. <laughs> Incidentally, I'm getting awful tired looking like a bum. Living like a bum, acting like a bum. You keep your shirt on and arrange that meeting for me. What'll it be, mister? Coffee, Ann. Out of donuts. Okay, give me some pie. Out of pie. Toast. You won't get an argument out of me, honey. Toast. Evening. Coffee? Yeah, a hamburger. With? Everything. Okay. Hey, miss, when's the next ferry? Every hour on the half hour. And by God, the way, one out of its house. Hey, uh, never mind that toast, lady. I, I just remembered something. What's the matter with him? Hold the toast, Eddie. We lost one. By the time the ferry returned to Center City that night, Jean had convinced me that Stiles' gang was the one we were after. The important thing now was to secure concrete evidence and ferret out who in the police department was making our records available to Alex Stiles. I saw Gene leave the ferry and disappear up the street, heading in the direction of the Royal Hotel. Out kind of late, ain't you, Manley? Chibby. Yeah. What's the idea? Where you been, Georgie? Took a ferry across the river. Yeah, I was tailing you most of the night. What'd you take a ferry for? Alec gets kind of curious about a new boy, likes to know what they do with their spare time. What'd you take a ferry for? You trying to scare me with that knife? Put it away. I said, what'd you take a ferry for? What's it to you? What are you trying to pull? Look, you got a long nose, Chevy. Why don't you keep it to yourself? Look, wise guy, from now on, you got no business. It ain't Alec's business. You mean I, uh, got to share my special phone numbers with you guys? The dame? <laughs> so that was it. You know, I, I kind of figured that. Well, the boss just wanted to play it safe. What's the matter with the dames this side of the river? Well, for one thing, too much competition. Be at Alex's apartment tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. I think maybe something's up. That's all, George. Gordon calling WFBI. Gordon calling WFBI. Come in, Gordon. Get this to Inspector Briggs right away. The Styles gang is planning a holdup tonight. This is Briggs' side. Where and when? There was no further information. Cordell, unable to make usual contact this afternoon, I passed him on the street, but he couldn't stop. He had time to tell me that much and no more. Is he contacting you again? If he can. I'm watching his room now across the street. He isn't there. If he comes back before tonight, I may be able to give you something. Okay, Cy, si, thanks. We'll be waiting. Atkins, better alert all the men. We may be needing them tonight. And now, here's our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins. May I say, Libby, how charming you looked at the premiere of Command Decision? Why, thank you, Mr. Keeley. But the men took the spotlight. You know, I think that's one of the most moving stories to come out of World War II. Having been in the Air Force myself, I found it especially interesting. Metro Golden Mare has done a masterly job of adapting it from the New York stage hit. I'm delighted they released it in time to qualify for the 1948 Academy Award. Isn't Clark Gable magnificent as the forceful General Dennis? The role is made to order for him. A brilliant job of casting all round. Walter Pigeon is tremendously effective as another Air Force general. And Van Johnson provides the picture with its lighter moments, with his portrayal of the amiably disillusioned sergeant. And Brian Donlevy is perfect as General Cliff Garnett. With such a terrific all-male cast, I didn't even miss the girls. But I wish I had been on the set of Command Decision to pick up a few souvenirs. Like the flyers, nylon scarves? Oh, I can see, John. You remember how the girls loved to get them during the war. They make wonderful blouses. 
And nylon luxes beautifully. Especially with tiny diamonds of lux. They're so fast, they burst into sud the instant water touches them. Make richer suds, too, that last and last. Another nice thing about nylon blouses and sweaters, they don't need ironing. It's easy to keep all nice washables lovely longer with the new tiny diamonds of Lux. Tests show that colors stay lovely up to three times as long with Lux Flakes Care. That's why it's foolish to risk fading or damage from wrong washing methods. Do you know makers of nice washables recommend Lux Flakes 33 to 1. They're so gentle and safe. Now, our producer, William Keeley. Act two of The Street with No Name, starring Mark Stevens as Gene Cordell, <clears throat> Richard Widmark as Alex Stiles, and Lloyd Nolan as Inspector Brake. Yes, Gene had succeeded in getting word to us that the Alex Stiles gang was preparing to pull another job. But what job? We had to have the details. All afternoon, Cy Gordon, from his room across the street, kept his eyes glued on Gene's window. But the shade remained up, which meant Gene was out. He was with the Stiles gang in Alex Stiles' apartment. All right, all right, that's how we're going to pull this job. And just to make sure you guys are as smart as you think you are, play it back for me. Okay. At 25 after 10, I drive up with you to the gate of the Willard Mansion. You're in the back seat, all dressed up in a monkey suit. Get on with it, Matty. Well, the guy at the gate takes us for one of the invited characters, so he lets us through. And once through the gate, I get out of the car and, boing, rock him to sleep. Okay. Come on, come on. I pull him with car number two and keep the motor running. Same here in the third car. Just the third car pulls in, I'm cutting the wires to the switch box. Then I start whistling. And when Whitey whistles, me and Mutt get out of the car and go in the back door to the kitchen. All right, stand by and keep the motor running. At 10.35 minutes later, Monk, Georgie, me, and you, we're going in through the front. All right, what's next? Oh, me. I, I cover him, boss. Look, are you with us or some dame? <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. I'm right with you, boy. You keep that head of yours where it belongs or some cop will blow it off, pretty boy. Yeah, you ain't kidding. Nobody me. asked you. All right. We head for the banquet room. I line them up, face the right and left walls. I keep them covered. I take them on the left wall, work them over for whatever they got. I do the same thing on the right wall. Okay, now for the getaway. Shiver and me, we carry the junk out. I cover you? Right. I head north on Highway 7. We meet back here. Any questions? No, no, no. no, no. Okay, no, no. Whitey, Nick, Mutt, swipe yeah. three cars. Yeah. Bring them around back at the gym. Okay. Now everybody blow. Go on, get something to eat. We take off at 10 o'clock sharp. Okay, nice going, General. Well, what's the use of having a war, Georgie, if you don't learn from it? Hey, uh, I'll need a gun. You got a gun, Georgie. Later. Okay. See you. 10 o'clock. Hi, fellas. Not leaving already. Yes, they're leaving already. Go on, boys, shove off. Why don't you let them stick around here and clean up this mess? Beer bottles, cigarette butts, looks like they've been raising a top. You don't like it? Well, if the maid was here, she'd really blow a top. Gonna be busy tonight? Yeah, for a while. You know, I read where they got gold faucets in every bathroom. Gee, they must be free with money. I heard Mrs. Willard has a couple Where of... did you hear that name? Who said anything about Willard? What? Well, I... I heard Maddie said the Willard man said... I told you never to poke your nose into my business. Oh, cut it out! Who do you think you're shoving around? I don't take it. You open your trap. I and will I'll fix you. You ever touch me again? I swear I will. Shut up! I hope they get you tonight. Yeah, I hope they do. For me. Royal Hotel. <laughs> Some dump. Well, why don't you move out of this sleep bag, Georgie? Well, maybe after night I'll uh, be able to afford something better. Got time, Matty? Ten minutes to ten. What you want to go to your room for? Did you hear what Alex said? Better if we break it up and show up behind the gym one by one. Yeah, it dropped me off around the block, Matty. Okay. See you in ten minutes, Georgie. Okay. calling WFBI. Gordon calling WFBI. Come in, Gordon. This is Briggs. Gene's in his room, Inspector. He just signaled me to follow him. Follow him? It's a little risky, isn't it? Can you stay there till you hear from me? 
I think I'd better stay here. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Gordon radioed back a few minutes later. He had followed Gene down Dock Street. At the corner, Gene stopped to light a cigarette. He threw the book of matches into the gutter and disappeared around the corner. On the matchbook was a message. Styles gang hitting Willard Mansion about 10.30 tonight. A few minutes later, I was at the Center City Police Headquarters. Well, my men are on their way there, Inspector. The Willard Mansion. How'd you get this tip? I'll tell you all about it later, Chief. We'll surround the house that way. Any luck, we'll get every last one of them. Well, if we're all set, let's get out of here. I got away as soon as I could, Chief. I appreciate your letting me in on this. Uh, Good evening, Inspector. You wanted me to keep you posted, Mr. Demery. Well, we're ready to leave. I've got my own car. Is it all right if Lieutenant Staller comes with me? By all means. Take the bridge route, Staller. Yes, sir. We'll go by way of Agnes Avenue, Demery. Oh, uh, in your car. Less conspicuous. Better leave now, Inspector. We'll follow in a minute. Now you see why we met at the gym, huh, Georgie? Uh, how do you like this, Manny? Regular arsenal. Yeah, the boss got everything here from tear gas and machine guns. All nice and handy in the basement under the gym. Come on, you guys. Get what you need and clear out. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Come on. Say, uh, ain't it kind of risky, Manny? All these guns so close to home? Risky? <laughs> Good thing to look down here. Go on, Georgie. Pick yourself a boom boom. Well, I'm taking this one. Boy, this is a honey beluga. Lay off, Georgie. That's the boss's gun. Yeah. You like Lugas? Take this one. Okay. Swell. Answer the phone, will you? Yeah, yeah. Sure, boss. Yeah? He's busy. Okay, hang on. For you, boss. Says it's important. Okay. Get those guys out of that room. Lock it up. Hello. What? Yeah, okay. Guess we're about set. You want to check over anything? It's off. The job's off. What do you mean it's off? Chevy, tell the boys to dump those cars they grabbed, turn in their guns and beat it. Go on, beat it. Hey, what happened? What do you mean, beat it? What's up, Chevy? Trouble? Don't ask questions. Go on. Start spreading. Got the entire state surrounded, Inspector. Guess all we can do now is sit in the car and wait. Chief Hormitz get here, Lieutenant? Yeah. He and Mr. Demery behind those trees near the servants' quarters. KRZ-8 to Inspector Briggs. KRZ-8 to Inspector Briggs. It's headquarters. This is Briggs. Go ahead. Inspector Briggs, call your office. 10.15 p.m. KRZ-A, over. This is Briggs calling WFBI. Come in, WFBI. This is WFBI. Inspector Briggs, stand by for direct message from Gordon. Go ahead. This is Gordon. Received urgent message from Gene. Family will not appear. Plans canceled. Family warned you were waiting for him. Over. Thanks. Stand by. Well, Staller, they're not going to show. Come on, let's break the bad news to the chief. You're sure of this, Inspector? But, but what do you suppose happened? Styles just decided not to show up? Well, it's not 10.30 yet. Uh, suppose we wait a while, just in case. It'll be a waste of time, Mr. Demery. They won't be here. I'd still like to know why. I wish I knew. Alec? What's the matter? Home kind of early, aren't you? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. Oh! <laughs> Tipped the cops, didn't you? Oh, no. No, I didn't. Honest, I didn't. Did you hope they'd get me, didn't you? So you dipped. Oh! <laughs> you dipped. Oh, no, Alex. No, I swear. You did. 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 You Open up, it's Gene. Gee, what the devil are you doing here? It's okay. After the holdup fell through, Styles told us to disappear. I'm meeting some of them later on at the nightclub. What'd you come here for? Look, there's a storeroom in the basement of the Dock Street gym, Styles Arsenal. I spotted his gun there early tonight. 
The Luger. When the job washed out, Styles put his gun back. Well, that's where I've just been. I broke into the room. You got his gun? No, but I got a sample from it. I brought along a Luger ammunition clip, loaded Styles' gun, and fired a shot into a bale of newspapers. Now, here's the slug. Get it to Inspector Briggs. The slug can tell us if it was Styles' gun that killed the Jannings woman and the bank guard. Well, gee, that's fine. That's great. But you know our setup. What if somebody saw you come here? I had to take a chance. Anyway, I think I've already been spotted. You what? Just after I fired the shot, somebody came in the basement. It was dark. I got away. But he may have seen me. Now you know why I had to come here. Get out of town. I'll tell Briggs. Look, if I disappear, they'll know it was me. Now I'll have to take my chances. I figure they're pretty good. Don't worry about me. Just get this slug to Inspector Briggs as soon as you can. The bullet fired from Stiles' gun was on its way to Washington on the midnight plane. At 2 a.m., I heard again from Cy Gordon. The light was on in Gene's room at the Hotel Royal. Whoever had seen him in the basement of the Dock Street gym undoubtedly had failed to recognize him. But that wasn't all that happened that night. In a fashionable section of Center City, Mr. Demery had a late visitor. All right, Stiles. What's so important that he couldn't wait till morning? And coming into my home... The tip-off, Mr. Demery, the tip-off to the cops about the Willard Mansion job. Where'd it come from? The FBI. Lucky for you, I was around. Take my advice, Stiles, and lay off for a while. They've got nothing on me. But maybe I've got something on them. What do you mean? This gun here. Somebody just busted into my arsenal, shot it off tonight. But why? What for? What do you think? Bright boys. Trying to match the bullet with a couple of souvenirs I left behind in the Meadowbrook in that bank. Bright boys, thinking only they can play at being cops. Okay. Okay, you're taking this gun, Demery. You're getting the fingerprints off it. The way I figure it, maybe the same rat who tipped them tonight shot it off. You got any ideas? Yeah, I got eight ideas. It's got to be somebody in my outfit. I saw him running out of the basement. Nobody else knew where that arsenal was hidden. Now you better get it out of there fast. I'm way ahead of you, Mr. Demery. When do I get the dope on whose prints are on this Luger? Tomorrow, maybe. I, I'll call you. Okay. And don't let that gun out of your sight. <laughs> Got Gordon on the radio, Inspector. Oh, thanks, Bert. Go ahead. What's the latest on Gene, Si? Well, everything's quiet. I stood behind him in the line of the cafeteria for breakfast. At 10 o'clock, he went to the usual place, Dock Street Gym. I imagine he's still there. I've got some news for you. Yeah? Dick Atkins followed Alex Stiles' car late last night. Stiles drove to a house on Oak Street. We just checked it. The house is the residence of City Councilman Demery. Holy smoke. Yeah, there's nothing we can do yet. Not till we hear from Washington about that bullet. But pass the news on to Gene when he gets back. I'd really like to know what's going on in that Dock Street gym. Yeah, pass the car, Well, it's been open. What are you going to do? Oh, hello, boss. Uh, hey, uh, you want we should clear out of your office, boss? Uh, just uh, killing time. I like a uh, little poker game. Stay where you are. Anybody fall? Uh-uh, boss. Not yet. Okay. Uh, too bad about last night, Alec. Yeah, Georgie. Too bad. My first job with the outfit. Fizzled. You, uh... You want to tell us what happened? Just a little change of plans. I sure could have used that basket of lettuce. That blonde of mine... I'm sick of you and your dames. It's for you, boss. Telephone. Okay. Alec Shore Bunny. What's eating him? Ah, he's always burning, Georgie. The job last night. Come on, let's get back to the game. This is Styles. You know someone by the name of George Manley? Yeah. You shouldn't. I'll see that he gets your message. What about the package? I can get it back to you this afternoon. Okay, meet me at four, usual place. Chevy. Yeah? Here's 500 bucks. Go over to the apartment, give it to my wife. Yeah? What is it, her birthday? Just tell her I'm sorry for last night. I made a mistake. Okay. And then come back. I found out what went wrong with the Willard job. Georgie. Georgie Manley. Take it easy. He's looking this way. Keep him on tap. We'll take care of Georgie tonight.
pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. will return with Act Three of The Street With No Name in a moment. Tonight we have um, a pixie for our guest, pretty, young Betty Lynn, for whom 20th Century Fox predicts the future as bright as her hair. I understand, Betty, that you took a special interest in the filming of A Letter to Three Wives. That's right, Mr. Keeley. I'm trying to decide whether to be sophisticated like Linda Darnell in the oh, picture. Oh, the designing female, eh? Mm-hmm. Or maybe like Jean Crane, who's awfully sweet. Or, or Ann Southern, who plays a career wife. Did you guess which one of the three husbands had strayed? Oh, no. The ending was a terrific surprise. But I did notice that all the clothes were wonderfully in character. Even the stockings. All the girls wore beautiful sheer nylons, of course. But Linda's were high fashion shades, like emerald and burgundy. But just as easy to care for, with tiny diamonds of luck. That's what the wardrobe mistress told me, Mr. Kennedy. It pays, because nylons washed with Lux flakes last twice as long. These tiny diamonds of Lux are a real triumph of the world-famous Lever Laboratories. They're so sheer, they burst into suds the instant water touches them. And the suds are so rich, they last and last. I discovered that myself. It's foolish to risk strong soaps or rubbing with cake soap, because those things make stockings run quickly. Strain tests prove it. In fact, over 90% of the makers of stockings recommend Lux Flakes. With Lux Care, it's just like getting an extra pair of stockings every time you buy a pair. Thank you for coming tonight, Betty Lynn. Thank you. We return you now to William Keeley. The curtain rises on the third act of The Street with No Name, starring Mark Stevens as Jean Cordell, Richard Widmark as Alex Stiles, and Lloyd Nolan as Inspector Briggs. Here's where we stood the day after the holdup of the Willard Mansion had failed to materialize. Jean Cordell, by winning a daring gamble, had secured a bullet fired from Alex Stiles' gun, which, when we got our report, might send Stiles to the electric chair. We had also succeeded in establishing an association between Stiles and Councilman Demery. Toward the middle of the afternoon, I got a phone call from our local agent, Dick Atkins. I've been tailing Demery all day, Inspector. We're across the bay now in Salem. Half an hour ago, Demery registered in a hotel. And just now, Alex Stiles went up to his room. Well, keep watching him. There's nothing new here. But with Demery out of the way for a while, I'll go and see Chief Harmat. Okay, I'll keep you posted. Yes. By now, we knew considerable. But what we did not know was that Alex Stiles, in that hotel room, was already planning his fourth murder. So the fingerprints on my gun belong to Georgie, eh, Mr. Demery? That's right. Here. Here's your gun back. Well, you know, you're going to get a bonus for this, Mr. Demery. Yes, sir, I'm going to vote you a great big bonus. Mm -hmm. Where's it coming from? With a stoolie in your outfit, they've got you stopped cold. All we've got to do is chop the stoolie and we're in business again. You don't know when to quit, do you, Stiles? Well, go ahead. Kill Manley. Give the FBI an engraved invitation to put you in the chair. Who said I was going to kill him? No, no, no. No, that's where you come in, Mr. Demery. Oh, you're out of your mind. You're going to be a great big hero tomorrow. Yes, sir, your name will be all over the front pages. Demery gets armed robber. Mayor's little man wins big police medal. If you think you can make me a laughing like this... The cops will do the killing. Now, listen, Stiles. No, you listen. I kicked in plenty when I didn't need you. Always around for the payoff, weren't you? Well, you're sticking around for this payoff, too, so sit down. Go on, sit down. We've got a job to do tonight. Here's where you come in. About three miles out of Center City, there's a factory, the Anderson Manufacturing Company. I've had it cased for weeks. And tonight, Georgie's going to be on hand when a couple of us open up this thing. over and have a little talk with you, Chief. Uh, tell me, 
Where did Mr. Demery go after we left the Willard place last night? Well, I don't know. I suppose he went home. Do you know where he lives? Uh, Oak Street, I believe. I don't know the exact number offhand, but 1680 I could... 1680 Oak Street. Where Alex Stiles went calling at about 1 o'clock last night. That's right, Chief. One of our agents saw him walk in. What? Before we left here last night to make that raid, were you with Demery all the time? Why, yes, I'm sure I was. Well, no, wait. I remember now. He went down the hall for a moment, the police advisory board office. Five minutes before 10, Stiles received a phone call. Subsequently, the Willard job was called off. Demery, I... I can't believe it. We've been checking his bank deposits roughly 20 times in excess of his salary. And that's not all. Here, take a look at this. What is it? It's a report from our identifications division in Washington. Requests from your police department for the records of these men. Every one of them is a member of Stiles' gang. Now, these records supplied by us were then made available to Stiles. He used them up to check up on prospective gang members. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Get hold of Sergeant Bryan. Have him come in. Yes, sir. Try and run a police department with stuff like this going on. No wonder we bang our heads against a stone wall every time we... T oh, come in, Sam. This is Inspector Briggs of the FBI, Sergeant Bryan. Uh, how do you do, sir? Sergeant. Sam, take a look at this report. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a request from anyone here for the records of these men? Well, I, I get so many requests, sir. Let me see. May I ask one I checked this morning, George Manley. This morning? I lifted one of his fingerprints from a gun. Was that gun a Luger? Yes, sir. Who asked you to check it? Mr. Demery. Demery? Were Manley's the only prints you lifted from that gun? No, there are a couple of other fragmentary prints. I identified them as Alex Stiles. Thanks, Sergeant. That's all. Yes, sir. Yes, sir? Get me the radio room. I'll hold on. Yes, sir. Radio room. Get me WFBI right away. I'll explain this in just a minute, Chief. KRZA calling WFBI. KRZA calling WFBI. Come in. This is WFBI. Go ahead. Stand by. Go ahead, sir. Thanks. This is Briggs. Get me Gordon. Yes, sir. WFBI calling Gordon. WFBI calling Gordon. Come in. This is Gordon. Go ahead, Inspector. Sorry. Tell Court Dell to get out immediately. He's in great danger. Chains in his room now, but he's got a couple of visitors. I can see him through the window. There's no rough stuff. They're just talking. You've got to get a hold of him, Si. If he isn't alone, you'd better telephone. What if they want to know who's calling? Well, he'd have to talk his way out of it. We've got to warn him. Call the hotel. Tell the fellow at the desk to, to get Gene on the phone. Let me know what happens. I'll be back at the office in 15 minutes. Right. Well, I'm sorry, Chief, but that couldn't wait. Cordell's one of our agents. He's been doing undercover work in the Stiles gang under the name of George Manley. Certainly ties in Demery. Well, what can I do to help? Well, for the moment, nothing. See, we're expecting word from Washington any minute. They may give us a green light to move in on the Stiles gang. Why don't you come with me? I'd like to. So you've just been changing your clothes, huh, Georgie? Well, you know how it is. Boss said he always likes his boys to look sharp. Hey, uh, what pitch is? Alec told me and Maddie to pay a little call. Just to tell you there's a little job on for tonight. Yeah. Yeah, wanted on the phone. Well? He says you're wanted on the phone. Uh, tell him I'm tied up. Tied up? Okay. <laughs> Dings. You sure? Yeah, who else would know where to get me? I don't know. Yeah. Now, uh, what's the deal? The boss will tell us when we get there. We got a car downstairs. Let's go, Georgie. Hey, taxi. Taxi. Yes, sir. FBI. Follow that gray car. Quick. Yes, sir. It's been 20 minutes since you spoke to Gordon, Inspector. How long would it take him to phone? Well, not 20 minutes, Dick. That's a cinch. Something's up, Inspector. Something we don't know about. There's nothing to do, to do unless we... Come type, sir. Washington. Let me get there. Ray test bullet from Luger 7.65 millimeter. Barrel marking identical with murder bullets removed from victims Meadowbrook and bank murder. 
Arrest Styles Gang and Demery immediately. Signed, Hoover. This is it, Dick. Get the men ready. Telephone for Chief Harmatch. You can take it there, sir. For me? Thanks. Hello? What's that? How long ago? Okay. That was Lieutenant Stoller. When he came on duty, they told him Demery left headquarters about ten minutes ago with the night detail. He had some hot tip about a robbery. Where? Nobody seems to know where. Let me try your short way. Right there, that room in there. I'll call a squad car. Hello? Yes. Yes. This is the FBI. Who? Well, just a moment. For you, Inspector, some cab driver. Hello. Yes, this is Briggs. What message? Anderson Manufacturing Company. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a message from Gordon. He took a cab, tailed Gene Cordell and two of the gang to the Anderson Manufacturing Company. They've got a plant out on Fraser Road. All right, then. Let's go. Right in here, Georgie, the cashier's office. And there's the safe. Sweet job, huh? That looks like a lead pipe cinch. Yeah, I pulled this one right out of the air. How you doing with the safe, Matty? It's open, boss. You mean they, uh, they furnish you with the combination? I told you I had connections, Georgie. All kinds of connections. Where's, uh, Chippy then? He spotted some guy following him. He's just been downstairs to take care of him. Watchman? Ask him. Chippy? It's okay, boss. Who was it? I don't know. Watchman, I guess. Don't matter now. Okay. Put the knife away. Get over to that window. Got the cash yet, Matty? I think this is all. Some bonds, too. Just the cash. Here you are, Georgie. It's for you. All yours. I don't get it, Ami. Go ahead, take it. No cuts for anybody. All yours. And this is one job that'll never get tipped off. Look, Georgie. What are you talking about? Oh, you mean you haven't heard? Well, somebody did a little singing to the FBI. Told them things. Like where I kept my gun. Like when we were going to pull the Willard job. Yeah, Georgie, we picked up a pigeon. Anything coming down the road, Chivy? Nothing yet, boss. Keep looking. Now, there's only one smart way to get rid of this, Julie, Georgie. And that's to let the cops something off. Scientific, huh? You see, Georgie, any minute now, a squad of cops will be coming up those stairs, and guess who they're going to find here at the safe? And guess who they're going to pump full of slugs thinking they're knocking off a safe crack? They're turning it off the highway. And who do you suppose is bringing the cops, Georgie? My number one connection in the police department. We worked it out together. They come from down there. We go out the fire escape. You'll never get away with this. Guy. Okay, Maddie, take care of the stoolie. No, not in the face. Don't mark him up. They're here, boy. Get going, Maddie. The fire escape. Pop him up, Chibi. Yeah. Against the safe. That's it. He fell to the floor again. All right, put him back. But the cops! Get back there and put him up against that safe. FBI, what's up, officer? Robbery. Cashier's office on the second floor. Who are those men over there? Mr. Demery and some detectives. They're covering the fire escape. You'll find the others upstairs. Let's get up there, Atkin. Sergeant here. Oh, I'm bending over in front of the safe. He's dead all right, Inspector. Who is he? One of Styles boys. They call him Shivy. Was he the only one who was in here, Sergeant? There was someone else, I'm sure. The room was dark, just the light from the corridor. The other one seemed to be on the floor, crawled behind the desk and got away. Probably still in the factory somewhere. Inspectors. In here, Atkins. Any sign of Gene? Oh, but I just found Cy Gordon. He's been nice. He's just coming to. All right, you stay with him, Atkins. Get somebody to help you. I'm going to look for Gene. Inspector, there's a couple of men over there near the dynamo. Break your break. This way. Break your break. Gene! It's Styles. He's getting away. The fire is safe. Watch yourselves, men. No shots up there. Look, Mr. Demery. I still think a couple of us ought to cover that freight entrance. You'll stay right here. Get back. That door up there, the fire escape. It's opening up. Styles. That's Alex Styles. Let him come down. He doesn't see us, Mr. Demery. We'll get him without having to fire a shot. He's got a gun. We're playing it safe. Let him have it. I said let him have it. <laughs> Gene! 
King, you all right? Okay. They got style. Well, Inspector, I didn't expect to find the FBI here. We got a tip on the robbery. We got a tip, too, Mr. Demery. Oh, is that so? Yes. From one of our agents here. Mr. Demery, I'd like to have you meet George Manley. Well, I'm very glad to Just meet you. Just keep your hand out there, Mr. Demery. I'd like to try these on for size. Well, what do you know? They fit. I just left the inspector's sign. He says we're going back to Washington, both of us. You, you got them all, huh? Yeah. The chief just radioed. They picked up the others at the gym. Sai, you're sure you're all right, huh? <laughs> Me? Oh, Brian Arthur's hide. What do you think? The street on which crime flourishes is the street extending across America. It is the street with no name. Organized gangsterism is once again returning. If permitted to go unchecked, three out of every four Americans will eventually become one of its victims. Wherever law and order break down, there you will find public indifference. An alert and vigilant America will make for a secure America. Signed, J. Edgar Hoover. Our stars will return for their curtain calls in a moment. Libby, what is the finest vacation you could imagine? Well, that's easy. A cruise around the world. Well, some lucky listener can win one in Lever's $50,000 travel contest. It's the chance of a lifetime. First prize is a round-the-world tour for two. All travel expenses paid, plus $1,000 pocket money and $700 for new clothes. Or $10,000 in cash. Think of visiting the famous sidewalk cafes in Paris, historic London, the fabulous Orient, the beach at Waikiki. There are 15 thrilling second prizes, too. Each and all travel expense trip to Europe. Or $2,500 in cash. You travel in states. Best accommodations everywhere. All trips arranged by Thomas Cook and Son. And there are 400 additional cash prizes, each a crisp new $10 bill. It's easy to enter. Just finish this statement in 25 words or less. I like the large size box of Lux Flakes because... Send each entry with a box top from large size Lux Flakes to Lever Tour the World Contest, Box 1, New York 8, New York. Only residents of continental United States, Alaska, and Hawaii are eligible. You'll find complete rules on entry blanks at your store where the large size sale is being featured. Send in your entry this week. Now, here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. There's only one thing to say to a cast after tonight's performance, and that's well done. Here are the stars of our cast returning to the microphone. Mark Stevens, Richard Widmark, and Lloyd Nolan. <laughs> Bill? Believe me, it's a pleasure to work with you once again. Yes, and not quite as strenuous as the picture, Mark. Well, I was kind of black and blue for two months after that one, Dick. <laughs> oh, you get used to it after a while, Mark. This is my third FBI picture, so I feel almost like a G-man now. <laughs> you know, I'm very pleased that we could do The Street With No Name at this time as our way of congratulating J. Edgar Hoover, who is soon to mark his 25th anniversary as director of the FBI. And we all join you in those congratulations, Bill. Dick, I understand you're off in New England within the next few days. Yes, Bill, I'm going to New Bedford for the opening of Down to the Sea in Ships. That's the picture that put 20th Century Fox in the whaling business. And if you ran true to form, Dick, you probably scared the whales to death. Nope, nope. In this picture, I'm a nice guy for a change. <laughs> what have you got planned for next week, Bill? Next week, a drama that's packed with action and adventure. It's the 20th Century Fox picture, Captain from Castile. And our stars, Cornell Wilde and Gene Peters. This is a love story told against the thrilling background of Mexico in the days of the Spanish conquest. All the makings of a hit. Bill, it sounds like a full house. Now, if you'll uh, 
Give me a box of Lux Flakes to take to Mr. Stevens. I'll be a popular man. It's a favorite at our house. Good night and thanks. Good night. Good night and thanks to all of you. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Cornell Wilde and Gene Peters in Captain from Castile. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Mark Stevens appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox and is currently co-starring with Olivia de Havilland in The Snake Pit. Heard in tonight's cast were John McIntyre as Cy and Ed Begley as Chief. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett and our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Cornell Wilde and Gene Peters in Captain from Castile. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>